Hello, I'm Tyler Riley, pronouns he, him. Uh, I am the TDF Online and Dance Programs Manager, and I am proud to present this TDF conversation with critics of color. Uh, my background, I am a black male, bald with glasses, wearing a gray shirt against uh, white closet doors. Hi everyone, my name is Alicia Ramirez. I am a Puerto Rican entertainment journalist based in New York City. My pronouns are she, her, and I am in an office with a painting behind me and a wooden door. Hello everyone, my name is Juan Michael Porter II. My pronouns are he, him. I am a black queer man who is living with HIV in Brooklyn. My background is a white room with a lot of doors around me. Hola, amigos y amigas de TDF. My name is Jose Solis. I'm a Honduran culture critic. I'm currently in my hometown in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. And my background is half a white wall with a Wonder Woman poster and a window with some trees in the back. And I have a beard, I'm wearing glasses, and I'm wearing a Kylie Minogue shirt. I was wondering who that was. Love it, here for it. Uh, so thank you all so much for being here and being a part of this conversation. Let's jump right into it. Uh, I'm really curious as to what inspired each of you to pursue a career in uh, theater journalism. Uh, and specifically, was there a particular moment when you realized that this was something you wanted to pursue? Mm. All right, so I'll, I'll go first. Um, my introduction to Broadway was in the Heights in 2008 in Puerto Rico that um, made it feel like I belonged in a theater. I belonged telling stories, but it wasn't until much later um, that I, of course, read books about musical theater and whatnot, that I decided to pursue it as a career. I initially was a magazine editor in educational publishing, and then I decided to take the leap to write full time because I wanted to write for people who didn't see themselves in different bylines and through my work make the arts more accessible to people, whether that be in English or in Spanish. I'll go. Uh, so I'm actually a former performer. I was a professional dancer, actor, and writer, theater writer for quite a few years, and well, nearly 20 years. And I would find myself frustrated by the way that many critics were writing about the work that I lived and breathed every day. I felt like that you don't have a background in this. You don't actually know what it takes to produce this. And yet you're standing in a place of judgment from it. I also felt that a lot of the criticism was arbitrary, such as, oh, I liked him because he was wearing a purple shirt, as opposed to any sort of engagement with the craft and like the blood, sweat, and tears that were being poured into it. And people kept telling me, you should write about this. You should write about it. You know the history so well. And eventually I, I did. I said, OK, I will. Um, I started writing about dance. And luckily, would, people really embraced my perspective and started offering me jobs. And I'm always here for being paid. So here we are. Give me your money to talk. In my case, I would say that I never really had a choice. I knew that I wanted to be a critic since I was 10 years old. And I'm very unimaginative and, you know, like I was one of those kids who became what he said he was going to be as a kid. So my entire <laughs> life, I mean, I've been working 25 years. That's a quarter of a century. Oh my God. I've been working, I've been working for 25 years, making sure that I can become who that little boy wanted to be growing up in Honduras. So originally I thought I was going to only write about film because it's the, the, you know, the art form that was most widely distributed and it's, it still is. But when I moved to New York when I was 26, I was like, hello, theater. And suddenly I went from like going to the theater like maybe once or twice a year to go to the theater every single night for over six years. And here I am. That is incredible and quite a testament. Not everyone gets to like, not everyone achieves their childhood dream. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really, uh, really awesome that you stuck with it. Um, 
But, you know, theater journalism is really at times difficult to break into. So how did you all navigate that space? So my one of my mentors was actually Jose. And he gave me one of my first writing opportunities in theater. And well, we, we continued that creative partnership and we become friends and then just learning on social media of the different publications, just take the same approach I took for learning about musical theater so far away from the Mecca of musical theater into finding what I could write about, find my niche and not just say like, oh, I wanna write about Broadway, but what in addition to my background and my byline is going to make me stand out. So just looking into that and just balancing writing for theatrical publications, for example, TDF versus incorporating theater content for a more mainstream publication, let's say like Harper's Bazaar and the Grammys, which I've written for. You know, I, um, it's funny because I was actually more of a dance writer and it was the publicists who were really reaching out to me. I would have publicists reaching me and saying, hey, mm -hmm. will you please write about this? Yes, I wrote about theater for Broadway World, but my main um, branch was Ballet Review, um, Dance mm -hmm. Magazine, Huff Post, and that's where I was, that was what I cared most about. And I would say, sure, I will write about your theater production, I guess, I'll go and see these things. Um, and I felt that it, it wasn't necessary for me to write about theater initially because there was so much more attention being given there. Mm -hmm. But then I met Raven Snook, uh, our maven at TVF Stages, and she was like, oh, who are you? And well, I actually sang karaoke with her daughter. She's like, hey, you're a fabulous singer. Who are you? And I was like, oh, I'm one like a part of the second. She's like, I know who you are. Like, you're a great writer. Like, and she really encouraged me to lean more into theater criticism. And I credit her with making, helping me to realize how important it is for a black man um, with my specific life perspective and experience to share how I view this world. Um, yes, dance is important, but there's so many um, other people who who don't engage with dance, um, who do with theater, and to be able to speak to them um, in a way that others don't and frequently refuse to actually is something that I'm like, okay, I'm committed to this. And since then, I have worked my hardest to constantly show up and say like, even if dance is my first passion, theater is the ambassadorship of the arts. So let me do my part to participate in that. Yeah, for sure. If I may chime in. Um, yes. Also, I've had Raven as an editor, and I have to say, TDF was my first freelance byline when I decided to take the leap and leap editorial. Um, like, pardon me. TDF was my first freelance byline and Raven was my editor. So it's it's a really special moment to mark at this point, given what the piece was about. And I feel like Raven gave me the encouragement I needed. It's like, hey, you can write essays, but you're fully capable to interview people outside of your background and to do this full time. So I'm eternally grateful for that and the opportunities that came after writing for TDF. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I love I love Raven, but I, my internet sucks, so I have no idea what the question was. Because <laughs> oh, No worries. Uh, the, uh, theater journalism has been difficult to break into. We're wondering what your path was. My path into theater journalism was basically me forcing my way through it, like I've done with every other single thing in my career. I, when I arrived in New York, I wanted to focus only on movies. I mean, not only, but specifically on movies. And what happened was that I got a job with a startup. I was going to be doing marketing for a startup called Stage Buddy back in 2013. And it was a startup that was basically compiling listings of theater and cabaret and nightlife, you know, happenings in New York. And I suddenly asked my boss, like, what if we also had like reviews? I mean, if we want people to actually buy tickets and go see these things that we are listing, how about if we have reviews? So I was kind of like 
uh, you know, to keep it in the superhero vibe. I was kind of like Clark Kent doing my marketing during the day. And I was Superman at night going to shows, you know, paying for my own tickets because no one knew who I was and going to shows and trying to find discounts and going to shows and writing about them. And in the five years that I ended up working there, I ended up writing almost a thousand different reviews and features and interviews. And basically doing this, you know, like moonlighting as a critic and doing marketing during the day, I was able to establish myself as a loudmouth also on Twitter and on social media. And in 2016, I ended up going to the National Critics Institute at the Eugene O'Neill Theater. And mm -hmm. then basically, I don't, you know, it's, but if you ask me how I did it with film, it would be the same way. So like every time that I see a field that I want to break into, I just force my way in. Huh. I, I had a similar experience to Jose. I, I want to know, Juan Michael, did you have a similar experience that you were working um, one job at one point and pursuing writing at, you know, at night or, or were you able to make a more seamless transition into writing full time? So I really resisted the um, becoming a writer full time by choice mm -hmm. I, I because I still had a performance career. I was very much so um, still involved um, in, in dancing and producing. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is as a critic, you wield an incredible amount of power. And I, I didn't take that lightly. So I, I tried to really separate my identity from it, but my colleagues would not let me. It, it became this thing where it was actually like, people were treating me too well or not giving me work because they were afraid of, um, well, if you work for us, you won't be able to write about us. Or, or we, we don't wanna work with you in this capacity because we do want you to write about us. And at a certain point, um, you know, uh, this also ties into my living with HIV. I've always been open about my status to help mm -hmm. spell stigma. And I had people telling me, ew, you being HIV positive makes me sad. And I thought, I have an opportunity as a writer to change this field in a way that I can't as a dancer. So let me actually step into that identity fully, embrace it, mm -hmm. and like work to demolish stigma, racism, discrimination, because mm -hmm. I just don't have any patience for it. Yeah. Uh Jumping off of that, uh, and you know, take this question as you will. Uh, could each of you share a story about when you felt kind of unwelcomed uh, in the theater? How much time do we have? <laughs> How much time are you willing to give us? <laughs> so Jose has one that's going to blow us all out. So I'm, I'm like, I'm going to start this by just so. One of my, I was at the Metropolitan Opera House, which has a, a press room. And I took a friend who was a former um, Iraq vet and we were watching La Fille de which is like this charming English um, a ballet. And this woman, a, a white woman, kept speaking to my friend and she would ignore me. She was sitting next to me, she would speak over me. My friend kept saying, lady, I'm not the one who knows anything. You want to talk about ballet, he knows any and everything from the beginning to the end of it. And she refused to. And finally, he was like, look, I'm telling you he's the guy. And she turned to me and she asked me, oh, well, did you see so-and-so in this role, knowing that, like, this man died 30 years ago? And I said, no, but have you seen Sarah Lamb? And she said, no, who's she? And I was like, oh, well, she's a British um, principal at the Royal Ballet. Perhaps you've heard of that. And I got up and walked away. And the thing is, I didn't need to one up her or be nasty in a way that that attitude of like, what are you doing here? Have you heard of this? Is something that is constantly being thrown at me where um, I know I look quite young. When I walk to a box office, there are times when people are like, what are you doing here, little boy? I'm like, well, I'm about to this rate your show if you don't get your shit together. And um, there's also that need to remind people that be just because I don't fit the expectation of what they think a critic should look like doesn't mean that they are allowed to abuse me. Um, whether I'm a critic or not, I have a right to be in that room and that's constantly tested. The, the, most, the last one was actually the same day that Jose was dealing with something. I was at the Joyce Theater and a critic essentially refused to give, or a publicist refused to give me tickets until curtain time. And at one point said, you know, we don't have to give you free tickets. And I had to remind him, this isn't free, it's a job. And I don't have to write about you. I could write about this exchange instead. And I wish I had. 
I did it because I fell into that trap of I don't want to hurt the art field mm -hmm. without realizing that by silencing myself, I was actually allowing abuse to continue against other people. So that's my intro. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, I, for me, as, as a Latinx woman with a physical disability, or, or as I just rather call it, a mobility impairment, Publicists are sometimes shocked by the fact that I am a Lanx woman and that I have light skin. And I have to acknowledge that my proximity to whiteness does afford me certain opportunities that my Latinx siblings do not have. But I often get the comments like, you're Latinx, like you're so pale. Just, really stupid comments and but whatever i just shrug that off i i feel like the ones that sting more are the ones that they stare at me when i'm walking and because i also look very young for my age they underestimate me and in turn they underestimate the job that i'm doing and they take longer to respond and a couple of months before the pandemic i think it was in, in november I had to text the publicist. I knew who, who they were because I, I looked for a photo just so I could familiarize myself with them and not miss them. I texted them and I told them, hey, you walked past me twice. The show's about to start and I don't have my ticket. Where are you? This is people being stupid. That erasure is so upsetting of like, oh, you couldn't possibly be the person. Yes. Yes. And thankfully, I haven't had to deal with that recently because of the pandemic. Everything is virtual. But now that in person live entertainment is coming back, I'm concerned that the time these gatekeepers had to right any wrongs, it, like, it's, it's just not going to happen, sadly. I do want to delve into that a uh, little bit later on, uh, mm -hmm. but I do want to hear from Jose if Jose has anything uh, that you wish to share. Yeah, I would only say that you know, and you know, Alicia and Juan Michael oh. have already talked about have already talked about microaggressions or just like flat out aggressions. They're not mm -hmm. micro in any way. I think they've talked about microaggressions coming from the gatekeepers and the people that we have to interact with specifically as critics. But it's also, you know, at the end of the evening when we go home after a show, not only do we have to unpack that, we also have to unpack the ways mm -hmm. in which the performances and the art and the shows themselves are not welcoming to us. And they're mm -hmm. telling us that they don't want us there. You know, I've sat in Broadway houses where the entire theater laughs out loud at a, at a joke that was extremely insensitive about Latinos, for instance, and everyone's like laughing, right? Like when they call Latinos drug dealers or they, you know, we're only given parts that are either, you know, staff, like service uh, people, like in the big, like rich person's house or the gardeners or the undocumented workers who cross the border illegally. And we are always, you know, there's only a part of Latinos specifically that's shown on stage and it's usually the part that's kind of like, I call it suffering porn. Like people want to go get off at seeing our pain and our misery. And we are so much more than that. So I cannot even, you know, and that's only thinking about me as a Latino. I cannot even imagine what people with like other identities have to face every time they go to see a show. So it's, I love my job, but at the end of the night, I do have a lot of unpacking on so many different levels to do. Yeah, and there's a lot of emotional labor that goes mm -hmm. into this. And now thinking about the future of the industry as, as venues reopen, a lot of emotional labor for the, the people on the show, backstage and on stage, and just being very cautious of that. I, I'm curious to see how that is managed throughout I do also want to add, um, I know I'm moderating, but mm -hmm. <laughs> I worked front of house for close to a decade. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's really all levels, particularly front of house and how they have to 
uh, reconcile what their directives are versus, you know, the public coming in and how do you reconcile things in the moment as well? Um, do you have any kind of advice for theaters or audiences and how they can be more welcoming to people of all walks of life, especially these theaters that want to diversify, that say they want to diversify their audiences? You know, I would say um, once you're, please. I would say once you're a ticket holder, show us the same respect that you would show anyone, whether they're sitting in the premium seats in the orchestra or the balcony, or whether they got rush tickets, or whether, you know, wherever mm -hmm. you got your ticket, it doesn't matter. Just show people the same amount of respect because we invested our time and our money to go see something that you're doing. You're not doing us a favor we are actually helping you we're nurturing you we're telling you that we want to be there so welcome us that way i don't want for instance any uh ushers anymore asking me if i'm sure that i belong in the orchestra and not the mezzanine or if i'm sure that i bought tickets to the right performance because they don't assume someone like me should want to go see something that i would assume predominantly white or something like that mm -hmm. You know, adding on to that, I, I think there's also the treat us as if we are holding VIP tickets or the most expensive tickets even before we purchase that ticket. Yeah. I'm thinking about the fact that there is a lack of outreach to so many shows to demographics. I live in bed -Stuy, and I'm here to tell you Broadway doesn't know that we exist or says that they don't know because they don't show up in my neighborhood. And mm -hmm. I have the privilege to attend theater and, and I don't have to pay for it, but I can afford to. My students, for the last past two years, I was teaching K through five, and the dream of going to Broadway for them is something that's impossible. They don't even know that it exists because they're not getting that outreach. That that outreach. I think about the playwright Donny Arlove, who goes out of his way from on top of doing his own writing and dramaturgy to finding grants to fund ticket giveaways to communities of different, different disenfranchised people for the people that he writes for so that they can come. And I, I also think about, you know, I know I have many friends who are in Broadway shows where they have a, an invited dress. I mm -hmm. wish that they would pack those houses with communities of people who would never get to go otherwise. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying like, oh yes, we're letting people know about it, bring people there, go into the community and say, we don't just want your money, we want you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to add to that, um, I think outreach programs would be a lot stronger um, because I, from, to my knowledge, I think productions, so, some productions have multicultural light liaisons. And I think there's a disconnect between the multicultural li liaison and the other PR team mm -hmm. and yeah. regardless of the demographic you've been employed to cater to, there needs to be a united front because the universe knows how many times I've had to, and, and I'm thankful that they helped me. I, I've been sent to the multicultural liaison and they don't know everything they need to, to provide me with the information I need. And it's just like, it's it's just messy. I, I, I really hope that in this simple way, everybody can get their act together. And secondly, um, and this is mainly for, for critics and, and journalists covering the show, um, don't treat us like we're less than if we are independent journalists. Mm -hmm. Because you need to understand the industry landscape at this point. Staff jobs, especially at theater publications, are few and far between. And sometimes mainstream publications want coverage of a show and they don't have somebody with the knowledge, the expertise to write about it. So don't don't treat me like I'm less than because I'm emailing you for my work email and not an at whatever publication media company mm -hmm. it is i am more than happy to bring them in so you can corroborate my my legitimacy but it, it shouldn't have to happen uh yeah. real quick can we can someone discuss what a multicultural representative for a show is sure um i i can talk about it for from my experience 
um, either Broadway productions or off Broadway productions, um, they have somebody catering to BIPOC journalists because they want to broaden the pool of coverage and give them more opportunity to talk about the show. Same with movie studios. I, I can speak from experience. In the Heights, they wanted more Latinx journalists covering the movie. So they had a multicultural liaison working with people like me because they wanted to help us like get the talent and the coverage we needed. That that's the main example that comes to mind right now. But like how that manifests, um, and I've never, I've never um, gone through this route. But I, I have colleagues who have, and the way that they explained it to me is that they were treated as if they were the diversity hire who was lucky to be there, oh, yeah. and that the resources that were given to their multicultural liaison didn't. They're like. I actually received a press release from the person who's in charge of the marketing director and like the marketing director gave me so much more information than was available to the multicultural liaison, even though they are the same organization. Yeah. So it's like, how are you equipping this person to actually do their job? Mm -hmm. I think also it's very telling that this multicultural liaisons only exist for uh, products and, and yeah. properties that they consider need that specifically mm -hmm. but for example like i what's the name i always forget what's the name of that um asian dance company that they always have the flyers and everyone's always oh, yeah so or for instance, you, like, but it's fine yeah. yeah can you yeah so like they go out and they're in the streets of new york city mm -hmm. giving out flyers in english and Mandarin and other languages. When's the last time that we saw Phantom of the Opera, for instance, addressing people in Japanese or Mandarin or even Spanish? So, you know, this multicultural liaisons, in order for them not to be tokenizing mm -hmm. the, you know, people who aren't white, every production and every piece should have that if they're mm -hmm. really interested in achieving something that looks like equity and diversity. This, you know, for instance, why did I get the emails about In the Heights, but I'm not getting emails about any other Warner Brothers mm -hmm. movies? You know, like why why am I not getting the Wonder Women emails or the Batman emails or whatever? Mm -hmm. Why am I only being catered to when it's something they assume, oh, he's Latino, he must only like Latino properties? Yes. And also I feel like the multicultural liaison is being tokenized while we are being tokenized as well it's it's like this chain reaction and and while it can be disappointing for the the writer just trying to do their job i i feel for the person trying to help me because mm -hmm. deep inside i know they're not equipped with all of the tools to deal with the number of situations they have to encounter yeah, I mean, from what I am hearing, it seems like great idea, not so great execution yes. in terms of uh, the multicultural liaison. And training is something that is vitally uh, mm -hmm. important to most jobs, if not all. Um, and training is something uh, that, Jose, I know that you have uh, taken up with uh, during the pandemic. You founded the BIPOC uh, Critics Lab uh, during the pandemic, and Alicia uh, herself before has stated that you have been a mentor. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk more about uh, what it means to be a mentor and talk a bit about the program and why it exists? Well, it's very sweet. Thank you, Alicia. But it also makes me feel ancient. I feel like, I don't know, like I'm like a bearded like wizard or like something yeah. like that. Uh, but, but it was anyway. really informal in, in, in the way that I approached you. I DM'd you on Twitter. It's like, hey, I, I like what you write. I need some guidance. You wanna you wanna have some coffee? That that was it. It's I I say men mentorship because I I like structure, but you know, I you you go ahead and, and describe it 
what, but also the, Jose, the you ASL. are a bearded wizard who just happens to be hot so that I can get into <laughs> it yeah <laughs> okay well thank you both now I'm blushing um mentorship thank you both I mean it thank you I just I'm not good with compliments but thank you I I never had mentorship you know, when I was growing up and I was that 10 year old, really obnoxious little boy who wanted to be a critic, I had no word to look to, you know, like no word to go to, no, no one to look, uh, to look to, no one to talk to. I mean, sure. I was reading critics and I was like reading books on criticism and stuff like that, but I wanted to talk to someone who was actually a critic and I didn't have that. And when I moved to the United States, when I moved to New York specifically, I crave that so bad because I'd never had it before. And mm -hmm. I, there's something that I've always thought, and it's like, I could not have been the only little boy growing up in Honduras who wanted to be a critic. I know that there's someone here like that, still like a little boy or girl who wants to be a critic. So it's not fair that they have no one to go to. I mean, when I arrived in New York and I noticed the same was true to the people that I was interacting with, like, who can I go ask questions? Who can I ask for advice? Uh, and there's something that's very prevalent in our field, specifically in criticism. And I fear that it's because of the idea that there's um, a lack of abundance. So people approach everything from like this, like lack mentality. Mm -hmm. So why would I wanna go have coffee with someone who's gonna be my competitor, someone who I'm gonna have to be fighting for those limited slots with, like why? But I've never thought that way. Like I answer every call, every email, every DM that I get from someone. And that need precisely was what led me to, to open the, the BIPOC Critics Lab. And it's because I had been trying for so hard in New York City, which often claims to be the theater capital of the world. And we don't have that need for, you know, to educate, to be mentors, to help other people. We don't seem to have that need to open doors. And that is something that, you know, like my house is like an open door policy, basically. Not Maybe not during the pandemic, but you know what I mean. I welcome everyone and I want to share with everyone. Like I, I have some issues with the idea of being called a mentor because I usually think that a mentor is someone who's like above you, right? And instead what I think of when I'm, you know, as an educator and with the lab, the way that I see myself as is someone who is their equal, like we are, we're all equals there. And the idea is that we are getting together, we are gathering in a safe space where I don't teach people, I share what I know. And I hope that my experience can help people figure out things that they're going um, through at the moment. So I, I'm all about horizontal relationships when it comes to mentorship. And I often say that I learn as much from mentees as I hope they can learn from me, if at all. That's incredible. And thank you for, you know, being someone who took up the mantle and created the program, because I'm sure the thought has occurred to someone at some point, but like actually taking the thought and putting it into action is really mm -hmm. wonderful. Can um, we just add that Jose did this with zero budget? Like straight yeah. up found, recruited the people, made the time that, that this was a labor mm -hmm. of love that he was doing from his house, reaching out, corresponding with people, booking it. And, and I think everyone thinks, oh, well, I don't have the money. That's why I can't do it. Well, Jose is the example that you don't need to have anything but the passion to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And more so than that, pre-pandemic, I Jose, you were someone who would offer a plus one ticket to young people of color or people of color wanting to attend the theater and just didn't have the means, uh, which is also something that should be highlighted because it was such an incredible thing to do. And how I came to follow you on Twitter <laughs> once upon a time. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that's what I mean. I'm all about opening doors. And if I'm allowed in and I have an extra ticket, I'm gonna make sure that it goes to someone who wants to be there and who doesn't even feel welcome there. So many times I even thought of myself as like, okay, I'm not necessarily welcome here, but I can shield, you know, I'm gonna take whatever microaggression you wanna give, I'll take it and I'm gonna shield this person from all this BS. So I even kind of found myself as some sort of like 
what's the word as a as a oh my god i forgot the word for those people that came with you when you were like dating in like the 17th century oh and, and uh the you're a or, you know not the escort but essentially the person chaperone, the chaperone. Oh, chaperone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i felt many ways like that like i would you know like if it was a young woman of color i would walk her to her station or wherever she felt she was comfortable with me walking because i also at some point i also thought about that you know like these people don't know who the hell I am. And I ended up meeting over 200 people that I took to different shows. Some of those people had never been to a Broadway show. Some of, the, some of those people had never been to a show, like mm -hmm. ever, like any kind of show. So I felt very grateful and I felt very blessed. And I felt honored that people mm -hmm. took me up on that uh, invitation. So I thought it was the least that I could do, which was the same thing that happened with the lab. That's another sign of like what theater companies are missing out on, or not just theater companies, but all organizations are missing out on, like leaning into these, this is brilliant, but it's also like, it should have been obvious to people who were paid to think this way. Mm -hmm. Alisa, did you have something? No. Oh, okay. No, I, 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 I just didn't want to jump in if you're about to say something. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, yeah, so, each of you seem to have like your own personal, I, you have your own identities, obviously, but you have your own uh, identities when writing as well. So can you walk me through each of your personal approaches to writing? Um, I vomit it all out and then reduce. So I'm, I really, uh, Jose and I joke about this because I, I work with Jose as well um, at Token Theater Friends. And he's like, you're so, you have this Lauren Bacall sort of purr where you're like flirting with people the entire time. And I think of that as, I think of writing as a conversation with someone who I will never get to meet, but with whom I get to be in community for a limited amount of time, gagging over the things that we both love. and. In that capacity, I do want to enumerate the things that like that we celebrated and that we that we experienced together. It's almost as if I'm saying to them, Oh, did you see this part? Oh, what about this part? Let's like unpack that and dig into what that really meant. And there are times when it can be super theoretical and intellectually rigorous, and there are times when it's really silly and fun and just totally like celebrating the majesty of of, of theater. Um by and large. I always think, have a conversation with someone who doesn't have the same level of um, information that you do. Don't assume that it's insider baseball, that they're coming from the same perspective and go out of your way to really be that ambassador to say, yes, we experienced this, but hey, did you know this gossip and this piece? Because that makes them more interested and that makes them then step out to other people and say, you know what? You like football, but this is totally football without being football. Let's go experience that together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So for me, um, I just tried to approach it in the most holistic way possible, meaning that my priority is to establish a human connection with the person I'm interviewing. Because at the end of the day, this person is much more than the project they're promoting. They're a person with a personal life they're someone who makes mistakes and that they need the grace and the support of the reader and if if i can provide that fantastic and also i've kind of accidentally fell into this category that whenever i get assignments it's usually an assignment where an editor says this is a really complicated topic make it accessible but but balance be thoughtful but also critical for people who don't know a lot about the theater and and make sure to include all of the gossip you can <laughs> so, so yeah that that's accidentally what people have wanted for me lately i'm like i i don't I don't feel like being gossipy, but sure, if that's what you want, I, I, I think I have things to share. <laughs> in, in my case, I would say that I approach writing from a very romantic perspective. 
And it's, you know, I, being a writer is one of the loneliest jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. Like you literally have to sit in front of a computer notepad or typewriter if you're like Tom Hanks and be there on your own and be there with your thoughts. And the way that I approach my writing is that I always take on this almost like Robinson Crusoe persona where I, you know, I have so much that I want to communicate about a piece, whether it's things that I love, things that I didn't understand or things that I flat out didn't like. And I put those feelings and those thoughts on into, uh, you know, onto paper or like digital paper, whatever we're going to call them. And the way that I imagine myself is like, every time that I write a piece, every time that I do a feature, every time that I do an interview, I think of myself as grabbing those things, putting them in bottles and just throwing them in the ocean with the hopes that something, you know, a line, a word, a thought, an idea, a dream, a fear, but something in that piece that I threw out into the ocean, I know that it's going to find its rightful way. And I know that someone somewhere someday is gonna find something that makes them feel less alone mm -hmm. and something that I put out into the ocean. Yeah, so um, Taylor, oh, sorry. Uh, this, no, no, go, go I on. I was just gonna say that I'm a slut, Alicia's a genius and Jose's a romantic, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that is really kind of you to say. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I, when I was doing phone interviews for whatever project at some point in this pandemic, because you know, like you you can't meet face to face at this point with your subject. Is it just me or I was just, oh my God, I haven't spoken to someone who is outside of my pod. How am I going to behave? <laughs> but it it made me feel a little better thinking, oh my God, this person probably hasn't done press for a show in X amount of months or probably freaking out as much as no. I am. But it, it's just me. No. no, no, I'm not even a critic and I can tell you, it's not just you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I, I feel better. Well, it's funny because yeah, a surprised. lot of people end up talking about so much more than what they were there to do. They're like, ha, la, 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 la. <laughs> like <laughs> Thank you for not being this person I've been staring at for the last 15, like whatever, um, you're someone else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've got a conversation. It's like, I have all the time you need. Talk to me. So, someone even said, and I go, talk to me, distract me. As long <laughs> as, as you don't mind me feeding my pet, you're probably gonna hear, you're probably gonna hear a can opener. You're probably gonna hear the water running, but it, it's okay. I. I am all ears for you. I I just need to do this other thing, <laughs> which I that's <laughs> that's very funny. Sorry to interrupt you, Alicia. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's very funny. But I think it also speaks so much about the way in which historically journalists and critics have been told mm -hmm. that they are not supposed to humanize their subjects, mm -hmm. and that is why artists often fear us. You know, like they want to put on this facade because they fear that if we, you know, if Alicia wrote and this person, this Tony winner was feeding their turtle, they fear that that's going to be something that looks bad. And one of the blessings, which is a weird thing to say of the pandemic has been that we're all on the same level. So we all, you know, I showed, um, I showed, uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting names today. I'm so yeah. sorry. But I forgot the Minari act, the, the Minari actor who just won the supporting actress Oscar. I showed her my plan when I was talking to her on Zoom, and we started talking about gardening. And I'm like, "Look at my plan," and we started talking about tips for gardening. And I fear that before that would have been something that, like, no, we all have to maintain this like facade of like professionalism and all of that. It's like one of the things that I was that I was thinking about when I put my my messages in bottles is that although we are often asked and we're told to strive for uh, objectivity, there is no career and no field that is less objective than that of being a writer and being a critic, because you can only be objective to yourself. Everything you write, your entire over is going to be subjective for everyone else. So that's what I'm happy talking to Alicia and Juan, because I know that they don't buy into that DS either. Yeah, the lie of objectivity, like, 
Listen, guys, I come from a lot of privilege, and there was a time when my writing reeked of that. It, it was so clear, like, oh, this is someone who is only used to bathing in caviar and pearls, and like, it was really unattractive. So I needed to like brighten my like. I actually stopped writing about Broadway shows and focused on off off Broadway shows. Like, I attended a production in someone's living room once because I needed to be in touch with what was real and not writing from essentially the perspective of the Vanity Fair crowd. It's like that's very limiting, and that's also only one aspect of my of who I am. Um, I don't know why I suddenly turned this into my diary, but back to you, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, but Jose, you talked a lot about you mentioned that writing is such a, a lonely and isolating job, but you do attend shows with people. Uh, as I'm sure Alicia and Juan Michael do from time to time. Does that ever uh, impact your process in writing? If you have someone who is like overly exuberant next to you about a show that you don't necessarily like, does that affect you in any kind of way? How do you kind of navigate that? Um, I would say, I would say, okay. I would say if that happens, it happens unconsciously. It's one of the things that I even tell people, you know, I used to tell the strangers that I met on Twitter and that I would bring to shows. The very first question everyone wants to ask a critic once the curtain you know, closes is, what do you think? And most of the time I'm like, I have no idea what I think. Like I need to process my feelings and my thoughts. So I'm sure that there's a part of me and that is affected, that is influenced by just being in proximity to people like i noticed for instance how my writing became even much more introspective during a pandemic because i was watching shows on my own at home with my plants while in you know the pre-pandemic days when i would be like maybe having someone burp whiskey and m ms in my ear and someone like chit chat on my other ear or someone leave after kelly o'hara sang and kiss me kate which that person if i ever find them again, you're my nemesis. Uh, so I'm sure that that kind of, you know, those things for sure must have some sort of effect, but I don't know what it is. I don't ask people what they think. I don't, I basically want to sit with myself because I know that I have to be honest to myself and true to myself and my readers when I'm writing. So I, yeah, that's a long winter way to say no, it doesn't affect me. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Jose. Uh, the only time somebody asked me what I thought, and of course this person is not going to remember because this happened years ago and he meets so many people. I saw Miss You Like Hell at the public and I was seated next to Alex Lacamoire. <laughs> and I... I said hi to him, I was like, hi, I, I'm a fan of your work, whatever. And and that was it. And I'm like, who? Oh. I, I wasn't thinking, oh, I have to be really professional. I'm gonna talk to this person in like two weeks. I, I wasn't writing about theater full time yet. So I'm like, okay, I I have this job to return to on Monday. I'm just, just gonna say hi. And he asked me what I thought, and I felt so bad telling him, you know what? This is a really loaded question right now. It's a lot to process. And I wish I could get back to you on this. And no, I haven't gone back to Alex Lackmore. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because I am, when you say that it's a very lonely profession, um, Jose, I agree with you, um, is particularly because I somehow shield myself from what's going on around me. I'm a, I absorb it, but my feelings are my feelings. And I've actually never been influenced by people. Like even I had a friend who was like, I know you're going to give this a bad review, but think about this and this and this and this and this. And it had no impact upon me. What I do do is when I write a negative review about something, I think of it as being my job to explain why. I have to justify myself to readers because it's not like I like this and therefore it's bad. It's I felt that these were issues and let's talk about them. And I always report how the audience responded in contrast to my feeling. A very famous line for me is, um, contrary to my beliefs, the audience gave it uh, a standing ovation. Perhaps they saw something that I missed. 
And I think it's important to include that because my perspective is not the only one. I'm just giving something that I experienced in that moment in time. And, you know, I think I, I had, I did a review once where I basically listed a conversation with someone else and I allowed that to be the review because I, it was something that I did not like, but I thought it was important to listen to another person's perspective because I was aware of um, the fact that I felt that the show was important and that for me to just rip it apart would do myself and the readers a disservice. So I allowed that to be the vessel um, for their view, for readers to receive that information. Yeah. You also, I wanna... uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, am I, do I have like a lag? I feel like I'm always like behind. So sorry, I keep interrupting everyone. No, um, no worries. But, I, I, but I, 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 I feel that it would be a disservice of me not to mention this. Because for instance, Alicia and Juan yes. are both my colleagues but also my friends, because they know that, you know, at a time when it's our society and our culture has taught us, especially because of social media, that criticism and having a critical point of view means thinking the smartest thoughts about everything and making sure that everyone, everyone else says is wrong. So -hmm. there's this binary mentality that, you know, like if something isn't for me, it means it should be for no one. Mm. And I know personally, Alicia and Juan and I, we all have very different tastes. Mm. I mean, I've watched one of my favorite movies of all time, next to Juan, who hated every second of it. And I loved him for hating it because it is his point of view. I mean, we both knew that we were not- (laughs) Gone with the wind. Oh! What is it? Yeah. It's gone with the wind. So we both knew, I mean, I didn't even attempt to change Juan Michael Porter the second's mentality and thoughts, because like I know better than to even try that. But more than that, with Alicia and Juan, I wouldn't even dare to want to try that because I respect who they are. I respect what they see. I respect their life experiences and their thoughts in such a way that to disagree with them only makes me richer. I believe, because it's contributing yeah. points of view that maybe won't change the way I feel or the way that I think about certain things, but are mm-hmm. certainly allowing me to grow and learn and mm-hmm. uh, achieve some empathy. I mean, I know, for instance, this about them, and I respect them for it totally. Like, I don't want to change their minds. And I fear that that is something that's not very common in criticism, where everyone puts out a review wanting it to be the ultimate review, the ultimate test of whether a piece is good or bad. While Alicia, Juan, and I, we don't really navigate in good and bad. We navigate Mm -hmm. in truth. Yeah, I think so. And also, when you think about writing a review, sometimes some journalists think of, oh, this line, regardless of how snarky it's going to be, oh, this is a, a genius pull quote. So let me just keep it super snarky. And I, I don't think that should be the driving force, mm-hmm. regardless of you enjoying or not liking a show. No, I, I mean, that's, I do think that exactly it. People are like, oh, will that be on a t-shirt or a mug someday? And I'll be in more, um, mem- memorialized for having said this really shitty thing. Um, <laughs> jumping back into what Jose was saying, I do think that regardless of what I say, I want the audience to go and make up their minds for themselves. Mm-hmm. If I hate it, I want you to go and say, you're wrong, like, oh, tell me about it. And if I love it, I want them to go and be like, of course you loved it. I hated it. <laughs> yeah, it. And one one thing to bring back um, Token Theater Friends, which I'm also a part of, one thing I enjoy about this format when, when for example, Jose and I, are talking about a specific show, it's always fun to see Jose's reactions to something. If if we can't be in person talking about this show, I I think just those social cues and those those silent cues, I should say, are enrich a conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, re- regardless of, of if we like the show or not. And as we begin to wrap up, we have a few minutes left, so I just okay. have a few more questions to ask. Uh, we'll keep it light, though, since it's the end. Okay. 
Uh, Jose and I both have written about our first shows back post pandemic. Um, Alicia and Juan Michael, are there any shows that you are looking forward to being your first shows back if that has not happened? If it has happened, let us know what the show was. That hasn't happened yet for me. I'm still, I'm still planning the first show back. I, I'm not in New York at the moment, so that is all pending on, on my return. And once I, I go back, I hope it's a show that can start greater conversations in theater accessibility and the stories that get to be told on stage and the people facilitating this process behind the scenes. I, I, I had my uh, first show back, it was Purcell at the Cell. Um, mm -hmm. on, is it 23rd Street? Uh, well, in Manhattan. And, you know, it's an, it's an immersive theater experience. And I was so like, oh, don't touch me. But like, you know, because of those nerves, at first I was judging the audience, the um, uh, actors on like, oh, you're not doing the right thing. The audience isn't reacting. And then I was like, wait, no, we're all freaked out of our minds. Mm -hmm. And the performers are still doing the thing. They're doing the gig and they're, they're still being compassionate and keeping us in this experience. And then afterwards I went home and danced with the disco ball for two hours. Mm -hmm. So clearly the show needed what needed to be, did what needed to be done. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, what was the best show that you saw uh, virtually during the shutdown? That's easy for me. It was a combo of um, a show called Binge and also uh, like kind of like the original Binge because it's by the same artist, Brian Lobel, who's a London-based artist who does performances around that kind of meet, you know, like TV series and your love of TV shows with like a therapy session and also like a custom made one person show made just for you. So in in London, uh, Brian was doing this show called You Have to Forgive Me, You Have to Forgive Me, You Have to Forgive Me, which is based on Sex and the City. And then he expanded that to allow other universes to, uh, you know, to use that same formula and it, called, it was called Binge. And La Jolla Playhouse did it back in the summer of last year. And it was probably not only my favorite show, Tyler, of the pandemic, but one of the most transformative, soul-staring experiences that I've had in my entire life. That's incredible. Alicia, do you? Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll I know. Go. Go, go ahead. So uh, it's what actually um, it was Sahim Ali's production of Romeo and Julieta, uh, Romeo and Julieta at the public. And I didn't see that, I listened to it because it was an audio experience. And um, for me, I, you know, we all know Romeo and Juliet, but listening to it in um, back and forth in Spanish and English, um, the, the prose and um, then like vernacular Spanish really made the words so much more important to me and tender to me. And I felt like, you know, people always, I know many people are like, oh, Romeo and Juliet is my favorite play. And I've never felt that way. And suddenly I felt like, wow, this is taking me back to when I spoke Spanish fluently as a, in middle, in high school and middle school and reminding me of those feelings. I felt like I wasn't listening to adults pretending to be kids. I felt for the first time that I was really listening to kids who had an experience that I recognized from when I was younger. So that's, that's something I'm always going to, carry from this pandemic moment. Yeah, I agree with you. That was one of my favorite shows too. Mm. Go, and I, that makes me want to see more productions in dual language, like yes. be it uh, live, be it audio, be it, like whatever, just, I don't need to be stuck in English the entire time. Things make more mm -hmm. sense. You can't translate certain things into English. And I think even the Shakespearean verse makes more sense in Spanish actually. Yeah. I agree with you there too. <laughs> That's fair, and I agree. And it may not have been on a mug, one Michael, but what is the most exciting place you've seen yourself quoted? It's actually the least exciting place, and so that's why I'm going to list it. Um, the I reviewed the Stone Witch uh, at I don't remember the West Side Theater, and it had 
oh, who's that actor? The famous actor. And I referred to him as being, he gives a line of a performance. Mm -hmm. And they basically, I'm saying that despite the show being terrible, this actor still does this amazing job. He's a total lion in the role. And they took that and like plastered it everywhere. And I was like, my friend called me and was like, we saw this show together. It was awful. And do you see what they did? And I was like, you know what? I love it. I love mm -hmm. that they are saying, yes, this review was totally ripping us to shreds, but we're going to totally take this and like promote the heck out of this because it was a lion of a performance. Yeah. For me, I, I don't review as many shows as I would like, and I want to sh change that, but this actually happened today. Somebody sent me a screenshot of the Harper's Bazaar culture page, and they have... I think it is the rankings of the articles that that people read, and mine was over there. And it's like, hey, your your interview with Melissa Barrera is there. Oh, Share it, funny. frame it. I'm like, okay, this is the equivalent <laughs> of a pull quote for me. Great. Now send me send more work my way after in the heights. Yes. <laughs> And then Jose, do you have one? Um, mine was surreal because it's also in the Heights related and it was last week, yes. a friend a friend of mine from Astoria sent me a picture of this giant billboard that had a quote of mine calling in the Heights, the movie of the summer. And my friend who's actually the artist who created Pursue that Juan went to mm -hmm. put this picture and I couldn't believe it. And the reason why it was so surreal for me was because like, okay, they spelled my name right. And second, because although I'm not in New York City at the moment, my family was going to be in New York City for the weekend. No. So the idea that my my brothers and my mom all the way from Honduras went to New York for a few days and that they were able to see how I'm haunting that <laughs> city, even while I'm not there, it just moved me in. Uh, really unspeakable ways. I can't so find, think of a perfect place to uh, wrap up this conversation than that. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Thank you all so, so much for uh, being a part of this TDF conversation with mm -hmm. critics of color. Please let the TDF community know where they can find you online. Mm. Sure. Um, I'll go first. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at a Ramirez Gar 31. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Juan Michael I I <laughs> or Google my name, whatever, I'm famous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Jose Solis Mayen. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> thank you, Tyler. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, TDF community, for uh, watching this conversation. Be sure to follow us on our social channels, uh, Twitter and Instagram at TDFNYC, as well as our TKTS accounts at TKTS. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>